water. Although sewage water, sewage is constantly being recycled using an external treatment plant common for each couple of units. So gray water makes its treatment cycle to become reusable for toilet water, for irrigation, for cleaning water, maybe laundry. And as for the black water, is whether being drained to an already existing sewage system. And if we don't find any existing sewage system, we can sort of use a, a black tank where we can store and treat the, the black water. But of course, we have to regularly you know, clean it. And of course, we have this sort of on-site anaerobic digester that will serve, to serve, to serve the whole settlement. So biodegradable waste and commercial waste is, 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 automatically, is automatically turned into, uh, you know, biogas, electricity, heat, and it's also a, a fertilizer. So we have the core, we have the bathrooms, we have the kitchens. These are fixed features ready to be plugged in by the refugees. So in that sense, we can stimulate infinite number of typologies with different number of scales, you know, according to the number of family members. It could be one person living in this, or it can be a whole family. So we have a core that swirls around at four units. So, so this is a clan. And here we have four clans that swirls around another core. So the part looks like the whole, which reminds us of the theory of fractals. It describes the theory of, of nature as a self-organizing system. This is when you explore the same pattern in different scales. So it's a never-ending pattern. So we sort of associated this theory of fractals in the project so we can delineate the matrix. So here we have four units, which is a clan. Four clans will make it a subtribe. Four subtribes, this is a tribe. And four tribes, this is a confederation. So it's a never-ending pattern. We can stimulate infinite number of typologies for infinite number of families. And this is a whole settlement. And this system, this system can be built anywhere in the world by adapting to its context. But of course, it has some sort of aesthetical value here. Although in Beirut, uh, after the explosion, there was this sort of voice in my head telling me that I should build this project for the people of Beirut that became homeless in their own country. So first, we had to identify the, you know, the implementation area. So the project must not be so far away from their neighborhoods, from their homes, so they can maintain their regular life and social functions. And uh, we sort of targeted three types of family victims. First, we had the families that have their houses completely destroyed and they're unrepairable and they needed, and they needed a place to stay, a new place to stay permanently. And some other families had their homes partially destroyed and, they, and it, they're like repairable, but they need like a year or a couple of months to be repaired. So they needed a place to stay temporarily until they get back to their new homes after, after being fixed. And third, we had the families that were living in old wage system and they got ousted by their landlords. So they need a place to stay temporarily, permanently. So uh, sort of identify the empty lands in the affected zone. So these were the private ones. So it was sort of uh, really impossible for us to use these lands. They're so expensive. And then we found uh, a really interesting land for the municipality. I became really friends with them, but they didn't give me the land. So <laughs> it's still stuck there, the permit. So we sort of built 16 houses that were supposed to fit inside 2,000 square meter land. And we sort of compacted it to fit inside 1,600 square meter land. And this project can, 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 can reach two story levels in a way that instead of having 16 families, we can have 32 families inside 1,600 square meter land. That of course the project can be dismantled in like a matter of days and the land will get back to its original state. So, so we did some uh, executional drawings for the project. So as you can see here, we have different it's different scales. Here we have open space, bedroom with the living room. Here we have partitions. We have one bedroom, living and dining. Here we have two bedrooms. And of course, we can reach three bedrooms. And there's this uh, ideology that says that like, uh, living in a shelter is like living in a cottage or like living in something really ugly, sad in a way to, to appear really elegant and really sort of elegant and really sort of, uh, sort of attractive in, the, in its design. So to be living in a beautiful architecture. So essentially, architecture is sort of encoded in a way to be assembled and dismantled in like a matter of days. So it does not really require much manpower. And of course, these steel structures are really, uh, they're really lightweighted. And the, and the civil engineers design it in a way that by connecting all these elements all together, we'll come up with a robust and strong structure. And, and of course, we sort of uh, uplifted the whole structure in a way um, to make sure that uh, the infrastructure is reserved and, and we can protect the shelters from flooding as well. 
And uh, as you can see here, we sort of reserved tracks for, uh, for the walls and uh, for the doors and for the windows. So it's all encoded in a way that, that you build it like a puzzle. So it's like you're building a puzzle. So this is the overall structure. And as you can see, we have catwalks. And we need catwalks to arrive to, these, uh, to their house. And uh, as, for the, as for the walls, we use uh, these uh, sandwich panels. You know, these, one are, these ones are used for the walls. And the right one here is used for, uh, is for uh, the roof. But of course, uh, what's really interesting about this material is that it's lightweighted. And it insulates perfectly. And it's cheap. And of course, uh, it's an amazing material. And, and we used for the flooring, bamboo flooring and vinyl, since it's safe, durable, and eco-friendly. And for the furniture, we use reinforced paper panels. So uh, the construction of this shelter is, again, very easy. It's just like building a tent in a forest. So this is a small demonstration of it. But of course, uh, th there's a little bit of technique that any person shall learn. So we need some tools and accessories and some bolts. So by connecting all these elements together, we have the, the columns, the beams, and we have a place reserved for doors, and we have the windows. And uh, of course, we have the protections of the windows and, uh, and the walls, and we need to have the roof, bamboo flooring. And of course, you need some silicone and some small materials, and some tools. So, but there's this important phenomenon called schooling. This is where people sort of learn as easy techniques in a socially active manner. So there'll be like corps of train builders that will train others and then the system will spread. So it's a, so you know, in, kind, in the case of any emergency, like the one happened one year ago, any person, when he learns this technique, he can build his own shelter, like. So it's a permanent temporality instead of a temporal permanence. People can stay in a temporal system permanently that can be dismantled in like a matter of days. And then we sort of made a, an accurate BOQ. We sort of stacked all the materials needed for this project. And it turned out that the budget per four houses will cost $47,000. So the average price per house is $12,000, which is considered negligible compared to how much a damaged house will cost and how much time it will take. And so not to forget that some houses require like a year or a year and a half to be repaired. So these people are staying one year and a half precarious. They have no place to stay. They don't have any home. So that's why this project is a need. And what's really surprising that it's not over. One year after the explosion, it, there are still families that are still homeless after the explosion and they have no place to stay. So this project is a need, is a must. So, uh, it's a permanent cycle. So you say maybe $12,000 per house, but it's a one-time payment for a system that will be used enduringly. So whenever a crisis happens like this one happened, you know, people sort of squat the settlement, so they are settlement squatters. And then when this crisis is over, it's whether they stay permanently in this, uh, in this house or they, can, or they can sort of dismantle it and store it so it can be reused again for another emergency. So it's a never-ending cycle. So... Uh, you know, six years ago, I really wanted this project to be built, but I was a baby. So uh, one year ago, the explosion happened, and I felt the urge to build this project, but it was, we didn't have the time, we didn't have the money, we didn't have the place, uh, we didn't have this much support, it was a it was short time. Well, today, one year and one week after the explosion, we did it, and we built it, and it's right here in front of you. But of course, it's not over. We're still redesigning. We're still working on the testing. It's still an ongoing process. Um, so this is just the beginning of the project of a lifetime, of course. But of course, uh, we need more donations. We need more help. We need more support from everywhere in the world. Everybody is watching us live. We need more support and donations to build more prototypes of the squatter settlement, not only for the Lebanese people, but for every homeless in the planet needs this project. So. Donate if you can. Well, uh, moving on to some other projects. We worked in Beirut, uh, but this time th these are projects for rich associations. So uh, we, had a, we had a project in Beirut, and particularly in, in a dense bustling district called Chie Haine Remene. So this area faced 25 years of war. So the result, we have a lot of devastated and unfinished structures that looks like this. So 
uh, investors sort of attempted to replace this structure by, by commercial residential blocks so ugly that looks like this. So the area has nearly 2% of greenery and very high level of pollution and no public attraction, no public space. So this is the land here. And usually in Lebanon, private space always remains too private. So that's why we miraculously convinced the client to create some sort of public attraction by introducing some retails and coffee shops in the ground floor and some offices in the first floor. So uh, instead of taking the maximum footprint like all the investors do to, to fit as much apartments as they can, instead, we sort of brought all the footprint to the minimum and went higher. And by going higher, you can enjoy the amazing views of Beirut. And of course, you can reserve a place for a public attraction down here. And then in order for us to retrospect the old unfinished structures of the area, we sort of brought all the structural elements to the extremity to be part of the architectural design. And then in order for us to neutralize the exceeded exploitation, we sort of subtracted parts of the newt slab to become part of the motions facade. And we sort of uh, planted with the marker air glaze so it could, so it could absorb the, the, the carbon. And then we sort of uplifted the, deviated the whole structure so it could remind us of the resilience of Ainer and Mene. So a simple rational building has greenery that surpasses the 2% of the area. And it imposes itself as a sort of, a, sort of an inspiring landmark element that, that, it, that is sort of bringing positivity to the context. So we sort of cladded the, the, the structures with the ACP panels so we can give it a strong character that would remind us of the period of our time. And then we sort of recessed all the glazing system in a way that during uh, summer times, these newt slabs, they act as shading devices, although during winter, uh, you know, sun can sort of warm up the in entire apartment. So here you can see the connections uh, from the inside of the apartment to the sea. So you see how uh, beautiful the Mediterranean Sea and the Beirut. Yet another project in, uh, in Beirut, in Shdaide, it was a client who wanted a glass tower. So it infused the street with a sort of muscular skeleton element that is fighting gravity. So, uh, and of course, it has a sort of dynamism around the street. And there's a double level, double levels for the, for the skin. And then we have this bracing structure that is holding the whole structure. And it, it hosts more than 100 offices and, and companies. They all overlook the amazing silhouette of Beirut and the sea. Well, from Beirut to the world, uh, we're going to talk about some international projects. So uh, we recently won the competition to design uh, a residential complex for uh, Renko. And we also obtained the most creative award for, for land complex. So it was located in Riyadh, KSA, in a, in a very high-end neighborhood in King Abdullah Street. So this is the land, 9,750 square meters. So in a challenge to create a residential complex that maximizes the use of, uh, of outdoor spaces in an area that avoids sun exposure, so the design is flexibly in adaptive response to its context. So the assignment was to design 150 apartments split into three types. We needed 70 units for the one bedroom type, 65 units for the two bedroom type, and 15 units for the three bedroom types. And the regulation, you know, the roof shall be 50% of the third, and the third shall be 50% of the, of the second. So first we had to identify the DNA of the project. So we got inspired by the sand pattern of the desert of KSA, and to create the main skin shield pattern here that will protect the overall project. And then here we sort of got inspired from Riyadh City's pixelation pattern, and we sort of created this uh, perforated uh, skin shield for the apartments that will protect the, these apartments from the intense sun rays and will foster uh, privacy among families. And then we sort of stimulated many forms, many pixelations that could be used for these apartments. So the iteration of apartments acquires the same essential ingredients to create a superior protected living experience. So each, each unit acts as an organic cell you know, that transforms its morphology according to tenant's need, synchronizing with real-time environments. So we sort of created all the types that we needed so we can just expand them. So this perforated sliding skin shield sort of transformed this location according to its orientation, almost like a nervous system that will link between two otherwise separate environments. So first emanating from a modular grid, we sort of created an infinity loop that reminds us of the infinity of the desert. And then we sort of uplifted the southern side so we can protect the overall project. So the southern side is the skin shield that uh, reminds us of the desert of, of uh, KSA. 
And then uh, the intersection was uh, reserved that will connect the overall project together, the private and the, and the common spaces. And then in the ground floor, we took the maximum footprint. We, we needed to fit as much apartments in the ground floor as possible. And then we sort of created some courtyards, like eight by eight, to make sure that every apartment will receive enough daylight. And then, of course, we changed with the heights. And then by mingling all these apartments together, it sort of cascaded up to reach 150 apartments. And they all enjoy the amazing views of Riyadh. And each apartment has its own garden. So we had to study the sun path to make sure that the skin shield will protect, will perfectly protect all the apartments. And then the, this cascading move, movement will sort of cast shades directly to the gardens in a way that the people can, during all times of the day, they can spend time outside in the shades. And then as you know, in Riyadh, the, sometimes the wind is sandy. So that's why this, uh, this uh, skin shield was sort of distills and, and filters the sandy wind and, and we ensured a natural ventilation. And uh, as you can see in the node here, we'll connect the overall uh, you know, spaces. So we have the private and, and you have the recreational and common spaces. And then we sort of designed the corridors to be dynamic instead of being just sort of uh, you know, linear. So this is the perspective. This is the view during the day. This is the view at night. This is the city. And of course, uh, we sort of planted all the, uh, all the apartments that all have gardens. And you can see the infinity shape. And of course, the main skin shield that gives the you know, desert pattern. And, and here we have the common spaces where people can sort of meet and, and swim and spend some time outside, you know, look, look, overlooking the mingled, mingled apartments. And of course, in the ground floor, we have uh, you know, the recreational spaces where people can sort of walk and spend some time there. And here you can see how the skin shield sort of casts shades within the apartments in a way that give it this image of, uh, of a desert. So in the basements, uh, we, we had the parkings. In the basement one, we had all the recreational areas in the courtyards. So we had spa, we had pool, we had kindergarten, we had theaters, and many more. In the ground floor, we had the lobby in the middle. And it is, here you can see the, the dynamic corridors and the courtyards. So this is the lobby. And here on the first floor, we, had, we, we created the gym in a way that you're, you're sitting in your apartment. You walk 10 steps, you'll be at the gym. And same for the sky garden created here in the main connections. And then it cascades up to reach 150 apartments. So the end user has the flexibility and liberty to open and close these panels during all times of the day. So we can have faultless transparency during sun absence or we can have considerable isolation during sun presence. And when the sun is present, it sort of shades, create, cast shades within the apartment in a very dynamic way, as you can see here. So these were the sections. Moving from KSA to uh, Kuwait, there's another competition we won in Kuwait City. It was located in an old parking lot that once used to be a government hospital called Al Amiri Hospital. It was torn down in the 1970s. So the aim was to sort of revitalize the place that once used to be a public destination for, for, you know, for medical services. So we were asked to, uh, to create a greenhouse on its top without mislaying its actual function, which is the parking lot. So we thought that instead of keep, keeping the same structure as it is and try to establish a public destination that does not actually blend with the parking lot, we sort of brought all the structural element of the parking to the underground, leaving the ground level freely open to the vibrant city in a way that the, that the greenhouse and the public will be mixed together under one canopy. So in that sense, a microclimate shall be created inside these spaces that are leveraging the connections to the city. So we got inspired from a plant cell. So the future project itself from the old arches, creating some sort of contrast between the old and the new. And, their, and the perforated canopy sort of create shades uh, to the pedestrian from one hand and direct sun to the plants from another. So we didn't use glass, of course. We used high strength polymer, ETFE, which is 1% the weight of double glazing. So this material you know, adapts well and perfectly to the high temperatures of Kuwait. So this is a project. So the metabolism of the project provides the end user with a sort of a natural micro environment and delicate spaces in a way that people can sort of meet and walk and sit amidst thousands of trees and plants and they're gonna be healthy, happy, and comfortable. Well, yet another project in Korea, uh, we had a small project to build in a quiet neighborhood in Seoul, surrounded by contemporary private houses. So we were asked to create three lofts in which the biggest one is for the owner. But of course, we have to respect the cultural tradition of Korea. So this is the land. 
this is the lovely client. It's, it's very small, it's 600 square meters. So uh, the built structure is a fresh reminiscent of the Chinese sharply curving roof that was once modified in Korea into a gently curved, sharp angle roof with strong lines and steep lanes, you know, inheriting some kind of quiet inner harmony and exhibiting some kind of naturalistic tendencies with avoidance of excesses. So we sort of created this Korean house and then we divided it into three lofts in which the biggest one is for the owner and two for rentals. And then we perforated it for sun access. And then in the negative spaces was reserved as a walk yard and you know, as a technicality. And then we created the, the floors. So we, we avoided the excesses by creating a pure form, a pure white material. But of course we enhanced on, on transparency, that's really important. And then we, we sort of attempted to respect the, the, you know, the surrounding context, but at the same time it has some sort of bold and audacious attitude compared to its surrounding. So in the plans, you can see uh, we have the dining and the living, like the living area and the ground, and the, and the first and second, we have the private ones. So even in the interior, uh, you, know, the, you know, even the ceiling was left nude and it's so pure. In a way, you can see the connections from the inside out as well. So architecture is really about the place and the people you're building for. So it has the ability to affect, to manifest, whether through spaces like this, through a building, or maybe through a swan. So we sort of completed a, a landscaping project for a client that was really interested in swans. So he called the project Swan Lake, Swan Lake Wedding. So this is the project. So it was located in a 4,000 feet altitude mountain called Duwar. So first we had, we had to create the, uh, the main, the heart of the project, the, the Swan Lake. And then up there we have the ceremony area. Then we have the, you know, the welcome drink area, the dining zone, and then we have a bungalow that overlooks the, uh, the Swan Lake. So we sort of designed the guidelines and we invited nature to do the rest of the work. So we just created the pathways, the, the lighting fixtures, and then nature sort of grows itself and creates the, the peaceful spaces in a way that people can feel like in heaven. And we also created some arts so we could remind us of where we are. Yes, we are in Lebanon. And we also extracted, the, while excavating the, the stones, uh, and we use them for cladding and for levelings, so it sort of transforms with the change of season. So another small project in the middle of the Lebanese mountains. You know, this, uh, this house is a sole mediating body situated far away from societies and the bustling urban assemblies, you know, surrounded by mountainous uh, topography and dense vegetation. It offers a way of life in tune with nature. So the volume of the house is a perched element detaching itself subtly from the ground to overlook the infinite sky. And then this ascending movement is designated by an accessible stairway that connects to the facade directly. And then we sort of press the facade to, 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 to define the entrance. And then we sort of deviate the right corner to give her a character, different character. And then we uh, enhance on transparency again. So we sort of scrounge from nature the essential wooden material so, so we can minimize as much as possible the environmental impact of the project. So through energy efficiency, eco-friendly material and a plain harmony with the surrounding, the architecture aims to conserve the biodiversity of the area to become apart from nature. Now this project is a process. Um, this is the ground floor, we have the living, and here we have the master in the first floor. So here you can see that when you're inside, you can, you can sense you're, like you're in nature, you can, smell the, you can smell nature, you can hear the sounds of birds and insects. Uh, we've also had the chance to design studio sets for TV shows. So these are projects that can go very quickly. In like a course of a few months, you can get to design the project and then build it. So our first project was in 2016. It was called the Hyundai Startup Competition. This is not really a band. These are five happy faces after the project was executed. So it was uh, inspired by this tungsten dam that represents the variety pop-up. So uh, we sort of introduced this tungsten lamp as the main platform. And then down here is the jury table that, that you know, represents the electrical pulse that evaluates the ideas. And then we have a LED screen up there. And then on the left, on the right, um, we sort of had these wings with multiple dispersed lamps that represents the variety of ideas. And then we sort of doubled the amount of the scene by creating an 80% repl reflective uh, floor. So this was the, the rendering. And this is a real photo. Of course, we use styrofoam for the, for the, for the wings. It, it affects well with the lights. And then at the same year, we were lucky to win the, the high-ranked comedy talk show competition in Nahonobes. 
So it was conceived within three parameters. First, we have this land window that overlooks the city. And then on the, on the left, we have the band defined by five migrating black strips that are climbing up to reach endlessness. And then in the middle, we had the host defined by a swirling element, defined by four migrating black strips that are climbing up to reach infinity. So after three years, we, we became the exclusive designers of the show. So, uh, you know, when, when I was asked to design the new set in the fifth and sixth season, before I do that, um, I used to spend some time with them and the colleagues, with crew members. We, should, we used to drink alcohol because they drink alcohol before they go live. So I used to drink with them. So when they asked me to go to design the new studio, I brought them this gift, a weed leaf. So, and then I thought to myself, that why don't I just introduce this weed leaf as the main platform? <laughs> so we created the main platform that looks like a weed leaf, and then with this sort of gentle movement of these uh, curves. And, and then on the right, we have the band, and on the left, we have the, the host connected with the, with the, with the gas. And then, uh, as you can see, we, the design erase its bluish tone to make people feel like home. And then we have this, uh, these framed windows overlooking the black and blue city background. So this was the, the rendering, and this is a real photo. But of course, so we sort of designed here a sort of an access performance stage where every guest would sort of enter from here. And, and then on the left, on the, on, the, on the band's background, we created these rotating, swirling uh, wooden stripes. So the overall design gives the late night show atmosphere. And also in the LBCI, uh, they wanted to refurbish the studios, but they had no, literally no spaces. They had no spaces to build any new studio. So they wanted to build three new studios, but they had no space. So I suggested that instead of designing three different studios in three different areas, why don't we just design three studios in one area by using the same barcode by just changing the graphics? So we created the, the main desk of the, of the dues, and then we added extensions. And uh, so this was the extension. This is the stage of the, so this is the set of the news. And by removing the central desk, we have another studio. But of course, we have to change the colors. And by just rotating the other desk, we have a third studio. This is what happened. This is the news studio of LBCI completed. So this is uh, the new studio. And by removing the central desk, we'll have Another show, which is Narkum Said, you know, and you know, of course, we changed the, the graphics. We used in, in yellow, and here, here they made another show after you know about the shitty politicians. So uh, it's made in red. So and there's a small tribute to late Ali Kade. So uh, of course, uh, Ali Kade died one year ago, um, and and he actually designed a show called Junite. It was never aired. So they asked me to create a new studio for Tony Khalife, but of course LBC don't have any spaces, so they asked me to use this space. So uh, I sort of removed all the particles and left only the background, and then I sort of landed a flying saucer, a gigantic saucer that would sort of start from its ground and then it becomes a table in a way that the, the host can, uh, can have multiple guests. And of course, we supported it with this sort of Frenchy elements, creating some sort of, you know, futuristic aspect. So it was an honor for me to design after uh, the late Ali Kade. So, uh, and, and this summer, we, were, uh, we got commissioned to design the stage of Murex Tour. They wanted to create a tribute to Beirut, the resilience icon. So the show is tomorrow. No, it's, it's next week. So uh, first... Uh, we sort of got inspired from the incidents and the events that happened one year ago. So we took the Salas building as a shield, the shockwave helix, and the flying debris. So we sort of extrapolated the helix from the explosion, and then we sort of embedded it in the, in the stage in a way that, uh, that the background will be the Salas building as a shield, and, and, and surrounded by all these elements, you know, flying around it, dispersed, just like a flying debris. So the stage is connects spiritually to, uh, to Beirut, but at the same time, the show needs to be luxurious, needs to be elegant. But unfortunately, uh, we sort of had to uh, say, you know, we had to abort, the, abort this project because the, because the Murex Door family, they, want, they were looking for somebody to build this for free, but it doesn't work these days. So they had to do something really simpler. So they imagine virtual can actually become concrete reality. And architecture really has the power to affect, to, to manipulate. 
to transform, to change, and to be there for people to change people's lives. Because everyone means everyone deserves a clean and dignified place to live and be happy. And thank you very much. Thank you, Alexandre, for this uh, presentation. So, um, for the first question we have from um, Martin Varga. So, he says that, um, First, he says, uh, con congrats in building a prototype of the squatter settlement. So, Thanks. so far there is no land in Beirut to build this project. Too bad. In case you couldn't find any, what will be the alternative solution to execute it? Well, uh, I think we already thought of the plan B because uh, we saw some closed doors because it's it's really hard in Beirut to find an empty land or even to rent it because uh, the square meter is worth really high. So we thought of instead of uh, building an, an overall land, which is really you know idle and and uh, optimal because uh, when you build in, a, in an overall land, uh, you can use the same treatment system to all the shelters and you can use the same you know tank for all the shelters. However, we, we, we thought of instead of taking a, a huge land and build on it a whole settlement, we can use uh, the, the people's houses that got devastated and we can build underneath it. Like for example, if you, if the, if you have a devastated house, you can build underneath it. Instead of building a, you know, a whole settlement, you can build a clan, like four to eight houses. But of course, we have to make sure that, uh, that the building is not threatening to collapse or to hurt anyone. If, but there are many buildings that are, you know, that are devastated, but they are safe. You can walk underneath them, so especially in Carantino. And there are many also buildings that got, they got demolished, so they became empty. So this is our next destination that we can sort of build, instead of building a whole settlement, you can build eight, four to eight houses. So instead of living in this building with eight apartments, you can have eight houses down here until they found, find safe heavens. So th this is the, I think this is the best optimal solution for that. Okay, um, another question is, many architects um, refuse to build for poor people as they prefer to build for the rich. So what is your stance as an architect that chose to build for everyone? And what message do you have for architects around the world? I think um, the role of an architect is to build for everyone, you know. You should respond to any assignment, to any situation. This is what we do as architects. We respond to any assignment. If, if we were asked to design a museum in, a, in, in the downtown, it has to be really amazing. And, and we, need, we need to study and to make sure that every dime we're putting on this building is supposed to be very well designed, very well put, you know? Um, but of course, whenever you have a situation like the one we faced last year ago, um, Architects have their role, they need to be responsible and, and, and have the courtesy to uh, design for emergency, design system and think of systems for emergency because they are very well needed. This is when architecture is in its performance more than of its, you know, of its uh, decorative shed, as you can say. So it's performative. Like whenever you, you, you lose your house, you need a place to stay so, they can, so you can at least sit down and sleep and think of what to do next. You need a place to maintain your life, get you know, and get back to work whenever a disaster happens to you. If you take a look at uh, at America, whenever uh, whatever a, a natural disaster happen, they, they don't have a quick response, you know. So uh, it takes them a lot of time for them to 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 cope and rebuild. So I think this system is needed everywhere, not only here, you know. For, in, in, in every architect should build for everyone. Should think of systems. Okay, so do we have any other questions from the audience? Anybody? 
Okay. So thank you, Alexandre. Hi. Okay, um, having worked in Montreal and London, he established Fuad Samaro Architects in 1997 with the aim of contributing to the cultural renaissance the city of Beirut was witnessing after the end of the civil war. Please help me in welcoming Mr. Samaro. Thank you very much. And, uh, Thank you very much. Um, okay. Um, the, um, the title I chose for my talk is uh, Context Chaos. And the reason for that is that um, we are living in, uh, in, in a state of chaos all over the world. Okay. Um, let me start with the first slide. So we're here today because of the 4th of August port explosion, which is the biggest non-nuclear explosion ever, a man-made disaster, um, an explosion that should have never happened. It was totally avoidable. No? There. No? Okay. It was uh, totally avoidable. Uh, it is only the result of total corrupt governance. Uh, of a country. The Lebanese citizen, unfortunately, um, is the last of their concerns. Um, this is the, an image of the port before and after the explosion. And um, Thora, the revolt that happened afterwards, uh, or before actually, um, it should have, um, it needs to be uh, put on, on a fast track in order for us to be able to deal with all this, um, uh, all, all this, the, 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 the result of all this chaos that we're in. Um, and, you know, the, the port explosion happened because of all the failure of the governance of Lebanon, all the corruption that is plaguing our country, and, and the chaotic situation that the whole country is being put into uh, simply because it's an easier way for the corrupt politicians and leaders to make money. And this, unfortunately, uh, is not only a local issue, it's a global one. In Lebanon, it's definitely on steroids. It's a, it's a much bigger problem, but it is a global problem. Um, and uh, this is um, manifesting itself with the rebellion in Europe, which is called Extinction Rebellion. In Lebanon, of course, this is much more critical and much more immediate but it's also something that is uh, globally problematic. And uh, the biggest problem the world is facing, this global village that we are living in, um, is all the environmental um, problems, the global warming that's ma manifesting itself everywhere. And it's effectively, um, it's effectively endangering the continuation of our species on the planet. These are examples all over the world. Turkey, Greece, this is Germany. And this is all avoidable. This is all a part of a man-made disaster. People knew about it. They've been talking about uh, global warming for the last 50 years. Uh, governor, governments have known about it. Multinationals know about it. Everybody has been expecting it. 
and it has happened, very much like what happened at our port. This is an example of Alaska uh, with a 60-year uh, difference. So what happened in our port was expected. It was people knew the danger was there. People knew that it could happen, and they still did nothing. And when it did happen, which is a real disaster for the city and its, and its people, they did nothing. And the resistance, really, has come from the individuals. You know, this is the real resistance uh, to all the chaos Lebanon is facing. It's, uh, it's the resistance that, that is happening all over the world um, and is being uh, spearheaded by individuals, not by governments, uh, some NGOs, sure, but the real burden is on the individual. Nowhere so is it more true than Lebanon. When you see teenagers, young professionals, even children uh, helping out when the government was pretty much absent is depressing. And the real resistance that we have to this chaos that we live in, and this chaos is not only this uh, physical chaos and the explosion that took place, which is really the loudest wake-up call that we have to get as Lebanese. And if we don't do anything about it, if we don't team up to do something about it, as citizens who come together to take over their country and move it in the right direction, we are really going to face extinction among the hands of people who know what the dangers are but choose to do nothing about it, okay? Us as Lebanese, we knew nothing about, most of us knew nothing about uh, the, uh, the, the, the potential for this crazy explosion. And the real resistance to all this cultural, education, and political disaster is really has been the individual. It is the, the plethora of young professionals, of established professionals like doctors, nurses, architects, engineers, entrepreneurs, all these people who are really living in Lebanon, putting Lebanon on the map, remaining locally and globally relevant. This is very key because the global village that we live in, um, you know, we used to talk about Lebanon and Beirut being the Paris of the East, Switzerland of the East, and all that stuff. That's physically pretty much gone. What is still there on the map, the Paris of the East and the Switzerland of the East, is really in the individuals who are, against all odds, making a difference and contributing to their work locally and remaining relevant globally. The minute we stop being relevant globally, we will be extinct. So people have constantly making uh, a change in Lebanon. People have been putting Lebanon on the map. People have been maintaining relevance locally and globally. And this is part of globalization. It's not enough to be locally successful. If you are not globally relevant, you're going to be extinct. Nietzsche, the great philosopher, once said, progress is like riding a bicycle. If you're not moving forward, you're falling down. So we have to keep moving forward no matter what. We have to find a way to move forward as a nation, as, individual, and as individuals, and as professionals. So where does that leave us? Architects, you know, um, are part of this um, environment. And architects have been making quite a, um, a stance for ourselves, I believe, in the country. Um, we have been uh, doing it on our own, pretty much with entrepreneurs who are the other uh, uh, part of, of, the, of the success story, if there's any, of, of all architects. Because without an enlightened client, you cannot have a good building. It's not enough to have a great architect or a good architect, because at the end of the day, uh, architecture is a practical art. You need to have somebody to sponsor the building. We don't pay for the building ourselves, unlike a painter. A painter can decide to do a good building, whether he has, an, whether he has somebody uh, paying for it or not we have to uh, rely on an enlightened client. And we have quite a lot of them in Lebanon. I mentioned the, the entrepreneurs who are making a big, um, big contribution to our culture and to our environment. And so the, the architect really, in my opinion, one of the first duties any architect has to do is to create order. And this is where we come in. We have to create order among the chaos that we're in. So I'll be talking about a few of our buildings um, and discussing 
the way our practice works, which is a process-driven uh, practice. It's a research-based practice. We do not uh, favor at all fashionable architecture. We don't believe in style. We don't believe in form, language. So we have no idea what the building looks like when we start working on a project. And it sort of evolves. It's like reverse archaeology. So this is Modulofts, which is in mail, and it was pretty much affected uh, by the blast. We'll get to that in a minute. Uh, Beirut, obviously, is a chaotic city. It has become a chaotic city thanks to um, non-existent urban planning or very basic urban planning, which means absolutely nothing. And it's a qualitative urban planning. It's not a quantitative urban planning. It's obviously a concrete jungle, you know, and the location of Modulofts is in Rmail. It's around 900 meters away from the epicenter of the blast. Our offices are located in Loft 1. And really, when we started designing Modulofts, we wanted, uh, we were inspired by the tra traditional Lebanese house, not really by its formalistic qualities, but by the order that defined it. And this order was, was, was derived at and evolved through history. And it, it gave something that remained relevant until the 1920s, you know. So it had the Liwan, it had four rooms either side of the Liwan, which is the central hall. Um, it had the, tri the tripartite arch, which allowed light into the most prominent room. And it was the logical, structural way to actually have a big opening. Um, uh, with the introduction of concrete uh, in the 1900s, this was stacked and we had three or four story high uh, Lebanese houses. You had the yuk, which is the uh, storage uh, area, uh, because the rooms I was discussing, either side of the Liwan, were actually multi-functional uh, rooms. They were not bedrooms or TV rooms or kitchens as such. The kitchens and the bathrooms were outside. So they were live and work rooms uh, either side of the hall. And of course, when we came to design in the 20th century, or the 21st century as it were, uh, we are also inspired by the global village. We have to relate to the global village. So I can no longer design a building in Beirut without knowing what, what is going on all over the world. So we were inspired by this idea of flexibility that was uh, propagated back in the 70s in Soho and New York with the lofts. This is the loft of Donald Judd. And the idea of the loft is that it's one big space that offered re flexibility, real flexibility, to the, to the inhabitant. So we took the gabarit, which is, which is uh, enforced on us by the uh, building regulations that we've got, which allows a 50-meter-high building if we are able to set it back enough, which we did. We ended up with uh, seven uh, duplex lofts, which makes 14 floors, which is the maximum that you can fit in under these uh, regulations. Um, and the idea was to actually have lofts that would have walls that slide in and out of the facade that it would allow you to control the quality of the space inside. The building is designed also along the lines of the served and servant spaces with all the services tucked uh, in the back, which was something that was first introduced um, by Louis Khan. So the buildings, uh, the, the, the lofts are actually on two floors. On the lower floor, which is the thing you see on the right, you've got the noble spaces on the front, you've got the services in the back, and you've got the walls that come in and out uh, as you want. On the top floor, you've got the two other rooms. So you've got two rooms at the bottom, either side of the double height, two rooms at the, on the top, which are actually a reference to the four rooms that you had in the traditional Lebanese house. So again, this is the, the direct analogy, but it's an essential analogy. It does not relate in form. So I don't really care about the form. I try to look at what is the essence of the traditional Lebanese house and reinterpret that in, in, in modern day. So we have the tripartite arch, which translates to a curtain wall. We've got the central hall, which is double height space. We've got the four rooms either side of the Liwan, which are the two rooms at the bottom and two rooms on top. Again, we see that here. And this is the, um, the major opening in the house. And what this allows us is to actually have these walls that are mechanically, physically moved in and out. And you have four different options for the lower floor, four different options for the upper floor, which gives you, for the engineers here, four to the power four, which is 16. 
and which gives you on the facade 16 to the power 7, which is 268 million and some change variations on the facade, um, which is dictated by the inhabitant of the building. And this reinterprets a concept first introduced in the 1970s by, by Allison and Peter Smithson about the art, art of inhabitation, where the architecture is completed by the user and not imposed by the architect. So we provide a system that allows flexibility within the space, whether you want to have an open kitchen, closed kitchen, open bedrooms, etc. And you can change that almost immediately. Within our offices, they're done at least two or three times a day. So this gives us a facade to the building that is con constantly dictated and changing by the inhabitants. The engineering of these, these uh, walls took most of our time in designing the building uh, after the concept design, and they were designed in collaboration with APAV and some very good engineers to withstand 150 mile per hour winds on the ground floor with an increasing factor as you go up. And they are basically a steel structure, aluminum clad, insulation in the middle, and they were prefabricated and hoisted into place. Uh, there's 28 of them, which was uh, quite eventful, to say the least, especially when you consider that the street is only six meters wide. The neighbors got a bit edgy. And this is the ins inside of the buildings and with, with different configurations. Um, the materials used in the building are very precise, three, basically. We've got concrete, exposed concrete, which is the traditional building material of, uh, of today in Lebanon, the most economic version. And, you know, in hindsight, we're very glad that we had no cladding or no ACP panels, you know, for obvious reasons. Um, the facade is glass, everything in steel is black, and things that are non-load bearing are white. This is the deck uh, on the ground floor. Again, we, we made the maximum use of the building regulations to benefit as much as possible. So this uh, doubles as, as a deck to our office. Steel, everything is raw, everything is honest. You know, the, uh, fire, the, the staircase, uh, the, the, the first floor is our offices and we enjoy the deck which is on the ground floor, on the first floor. And this is what we went through on the 4th of August. We were very fortunate that we all made it out of the office in one piece. We had four injured staff out of the six that were there at the time, two, two of whom are here. And, uh, and they, they went through quite a lot, but we are very grateful that we we made it out all in one piece. This is the office before and after. With so it's quite devastating. But we were able to, with the help of one or two architects who were not in the office at the time and who were, uh, were unaffected, to actually um, put everything back together in a temporary kind of way and go back to operation on Saturday. So we were hit on Tuesday evening, our computers were on Saturday morning and we were back in operation. And this is part of the resistance that we as Lebanese have had to live with and deal with and, and, and do. Um, basically, just to stay um, not only alive, but to actually stay here and to maintain a viable Lebanon. Because at the end of the day, if you have a country with, uh, with a population that is totally uneducated, uncultured, unproductive, un irrelevant, there is no Lebanon, you know, and, at, and today our government and our politicians are destroying the physical part of Lebanon. We have very little control over that for now. We should do something. Um, however, our minds, our abilities, our drive, our desires, our aspirations is ours. They can't easily take that away from us. And we, by sep October or September, I can't remember, uh, we got the building back to pretty much where it was with a few battle scars that we wear proudly. This is another building, uh, the Kassad uh, building, the Center for Arabic Studies and Intercultural Dialogue at Balamand, um, which was completed in 2016, I believe. And it's located at the University of Balamand, overlooking the Mediterranean Sea, uh, within a walnut grove on a gently sloping site and we wanted in this project uh, to look back again at the essence of the public architecture of Lebanon, uh, the public um, 
uh, architecture of, of, of yesteryears in Lebanon. And we have a lot of that, but nobody really looks at that or links to that as much. Everybody uh, just sticks to the traditional Lebanese house. So you get these municipalities coming up all over the place that looks like, you know, uh, big, you know, overblown, irrelevant, kitschy houses. So we've got a traditional public architecture which is worth looking at. And we started with that, which is the slide on the, on, on the left, as a diagram. And, uh, you know, when, when you build on a slope in Lebanon, you build perpendicular to the slope. This was when you were building in, in masonry. You had to worry about gravity a bit more. And then this opened up because the, the main concept and the driving force behind this project uh, is, is the notion of dialogue. It's a dialogue between east and west, it's a, but also it's a dialogue with everything. It's a dialogue with nature, it's a dialogue with its site, it's dialogue with its neighbors. So we wanted, so the word dialogue comes into everything that we did from that point onwards. So the building opens up to the west. It's not a protective building, it's not a, it's not a fortress. It, it, it develops into a dialogue with the street, so it takes the direction of the street on one side. It has a dialogue with the west, or with the sea, which is the, the a metaphor for, for traveling abroad and dealing with other cultures, other nations, possibly the West, Lebanon being between the East and the West. It was a dialogue with nature, so the landscape, we integrated the building into the landscape, we maintained the, the walnut grove, we didn't touch a single part of it. Um, again, dialogue with the street, it allowed p passage underneath it into the building, Again, the materials are all uh, concrete and steel and glass with a very clear uh, language that was set up and that was adhered to. So the building basically uh, speaks for itself. Again, because it's on a slope, there was no single entry point. So the building is on three floors and there's an entrance on each of the three floors. So even when we were doing the, the drawings, you know, uh, you know, calling a certain floor, the ground floor didn't really make much sense because they're all ground floors, you know? So, so we had access at the lower floor from here, at the middle floor in there, and there was a staircase that took us up to the roof garden. We've got um, the entrance on the middle floor. That's Eva, by the way. Okay. So, and, and we had the staircase going up to the roof and with the roof. And the building was also responsive. It actually had a dialogue with the sun you know, and where we get natural light, where we need to protect ourselves from the sun. And this, this is the sort of the intention and the reality. Um, and you had these louvers, which were an interpretation of the traditional arabesque. Arabesque is the uh, play of geometry in scale and, and, uh, and, and orientation or rotation or whatever. And we wanted to really simplify that. I mean, we were not going to go into a, a reinterpretation of arabesque, you know. So we just took the line as a simple form. And so these louvers were a play in terms of the density and in terms of the size of the louvers. Um, and where you didn't need them, obviously, on the north-facing glass, they stopped. Again, the material, as I said, everything that's structural is concrete. Everything, all floors are basalt, inside and out. Uh, everything that's in metal is black. All non-load-bearing ceilings and walls are white. And once you have that sort of clear, you know, language set up, the decisions take themselves. That's a project that's one of the first projects that I did, which was in a school in the south of Lebanon, which was built in 1960. The school was actually started in the 1800s, 1890s. And in 1946, it became uh, the first non-sectarian mixed school in the south of Lebanon. Uh, my grandfather was the, um, was the schoolmaster there for many years, and he got um, Constantine Doxiades um, and the Ford Foundation to donate the building back in 1960. So the building, which is, which is located on a 10,000 square meter rectangular site in Merjayoun, Merjayoun being overlooking the, the uh, Merj, the valley, with all its sort of uh, checkerboard um, planting and you know, with all the context of the uh, Lebanese houses that are all derelict and in risk of disappearing eventually. Um, and Doxiadis was a very interesting architect. He was the foremost urban planner after the Second World War. And he was more interested in the relationship of, of standard units with one another rather than with the actual unit itself. 
So he created like a necklace of, of routes, of passageways that connected identical units between themselves. So this is the campus that was built in 1961 uh, with, a, with a beautiful plan and it, it's still, today it's pretty much run down, but it's still very charming and very attractive. So we analyzed this, this, uh, this urban fabric really, because it is at the scale of the urban fabric, and we wanted to tag into it. We wanted to actually have an assembly hall which embodied the ethos of the school, which was much more specific than the standard units that Doxiadis was, was uh, starting with, but that actually worked with that. So it was sort of Doxiadis 2.0. So the building sits and nestles into the most disadvantaged area of the site, trying to act as a catalyst to improve it. There's the main street that accesses the school from the, from the village or from the town. So, and because the assembly hall also had to play a community role. So we wanted, to be, we wanted it to be present as you approach the school every day. It was there, it was the, the, the kind of thing that called you and that, that the, you would relate to. It also, unlike the generic volumes of Doxiadis, it actually locked itself into sight. So it actually splayed one of the walls uh, to actually relate to the street where it was and it actually introduced the green areas and connected into the, uh, the network. This was the initial sketch for the uh, site where the, where the whole network of covered walkways would actually work, into, work themselves into the hall. And the hall, the assembly hall, would be uh, a, a, a metaphor for the school itself and its ethos. You see, as, as, as a village school, this, there was no us and them. There was no uh, authoritarianism between the teaching staff and the students. They were all part of the same family. You know, so you, you, you know, your math teacher could teach you during the day and they're over having a drink with your parents in the evening. So we, and, and you know, the, the critical thing was water and the, the Litani River is, is a part of that. And I also wanted to, to, uh, to highlight the value of education because this, remember, this is in the south of Lebanon. It, is a, it was an occupied area and a troubled area. And in my opinion, this is the true resistance, you know, and this is, and there's no point liberating a land from occupation if there is no educated, cultured people to liberate. You know, if, if they end up being, you know, totally irrelevant, you might as well give them away to whoever. So this, th there's a very important role that the school plays here. And the idea was that you would have 300 students in the center of the hall, and in a similar way to a Greek uh, um, a temple, you would have uh, a who would cascade down to the stage. So there is no authoritarian us and them between student and teacher. And they would actually act as a decoration within the inside of the temple. They are the value of why you are there. So the student is the center of, of everything that you do in the school, which is the way it's run at the moment. So the building is, you know, at some point, the building, after you set up these principles, it, it, the building sort of really leads you to go places. So again, the frame is concrete, as was the doxiadis, the infill panels, um, um, and then the roof is, 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 is uh, uh, are copper clad, there are 30 copper clad skylights that are an abstraction of the uh, Lebanese um, pyramid, uh, uh, red tile roof, uh, just to act as a, as a monument to these houses if the ignorant population eventually gets rid of them, you know? So the building is about the past and about the future. This is a model that we did for the, uh, for the school, for the assembly hall. And this is how the light, and you see the, the, the assembly hall, it, it connects to um, different levels of the school. So, um, Sorry, another technical glitch. Are you? No. I escape it here. So uh, let me go. Halim, let me go there. Hi. Okay, hi. Thank you. Ah, 
that's, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. So sorry about that. So uh, the assembly hall links to the three different levels that are around it. So you can again access it from all the levels. So the whole idea of it being something that is combining rather than separating was very important. Um, and when I first presented the project to uh, the board of trustees, uh, the son of the founder, who was at the time in his 80s, said that the building looks as though it, was, it has always been there, which was a very nice compliment for me. So this is the interior, empty and, and used up and filled up. Um, okay, so we're moving on to another project that we uh, did just before the uh, just before the explosion, actually. This is in the south of Lebanon. It's a very steep site. It's, um, it's an interesting site because um, it's very rocky. It's, 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 it's a site that has three or four different zones to it, including the middle part, with, which is gray on the screen, which is called al Jinn, which is the sort of uh, devil's bastion or something. And there's an olive grove at the, uh, at the bottom, um, the grandfather of the owner now used to plant it with wheat. And because it was very steep, they made very shallow uh, terraces. And it, it all became yellow, and that was, that's why it was called the yellow fields. So we wanted to maintain that. And they had a very interesting path, um, which sort of zigzagged up the slope. And it was um, so that the cows could actually be brought up to plow the land. And we wanted to maintain that. We didn't want to take that away. And the program the guy wanted was quite severe. And we didn't want to have this sort of mammoth building uh, on the site. So we decided to actually um, build literally just platforms on the site. And the main house, the, the concept sketch for that, uh, was to actually just maintain the actual slope of the land, create a lid on top of it from the access road on the top, and allow the spaces in between to exist. And for this path, which actually zigzagged up and down the land to stay there and to scatter the functions that were needed for this house along the path. So encouraging the users to maintain that path. So this is the arrival point at the very top uh, with, the, with the views. And, and the, the, the house really is below you. So you go down, okay. So you go down the slope, um, which I can't point to unfortunately, but anyway. You go down and you arrive into the reception, which is on the right. Um, and the, the basically the spaces in between the roof and the ground is where the main house is. 